Antony, you're very welcome. I'm not uh, Michael Portillo or David Cameron, and uh, I don't speak fluently without at least some notes as a crutch. I promise I won't look at them the whole time, but I know that they're here, uh, just in case I forget what I was going to say. Uh, what I am clear about is that I am going to be fined um, for a reason that will emerge in a second. A few months ago, my wife and I were on holiday in Sicily, and we got into conversation with a waiter uh, in a good restaurant. Um, uh, he spoke reasonable English, and my wife speaks rather good Italian. And we worked out quite quickly that he was interested in football. And uh, so, in the course of conversation, we said to him, uh, what team do you support? Imagining that he would uh, name an Italian team, maybe Palermo on the island of Sicily. But no, he was absolutely clear, Arsenal. It's a small world, isn't it? There we are in a, in a small place in Sicily, and Arsenal, his, his principal ambition in life, as far as we can tell, was to come and watch a home match uh, in this place. Extraordinary. Um, I, everybody in this room is interested in uh, consultation, but uh, let me suggest that you're mainly interested in consultation with a capital C in an almost technical sense. And what I want to do, and I think it's consistent with what Michael was talking about, is uh, extend laterally, so to speak, the idea of, uh, of consulta consultation in a way that Quinton uh, was doing. What I'm getting at, I think, will emerge gradually as I go on. I used to be, emphasis on the past tense, I used to be a pretty well unqualified admirer of the UK system of government. And I was a pretty well uh, unqualified admirer uh, because it had uh, several characteristics that I thought were admirable. Uh, one was its stability in comparison with France in the old days, uh, with Italy uh, practically all the time. Its accountability. Here you had a centralized system centered on London, a system in which power was concentrated in the hands of the capital G government of ministers of the crown. Uh, and the fact that you knew who was taking all the big decisions made it possible quite easily for you to hold those people to account. The Americans have a phrase, uh, throw the rascals out. But to throw the rascals out, you have to know who the rascals are. And in the case of the UK, unlike in the US much of the time, it's by no means clear uh, who the rascals are. It was also a, uh, a system in which it was possible for ministers to take decisions. Uh, there was less dithering than there was in many other countries. And not least, uh, it was a, uh, a country governed by people who on the whole were pretty competent. Uh, there was a certain amount of screwing up, for example, Suez, for example, the poll tax, for example, the, at least the rate at which we went into the European exchange rate mechanism uh, in the late 1990s, in the late 1980s. Uh, of course, there were mistakes, but by and large, uh, this was a system of government run by competent uh, people. It was a system of which most Brits were pretty proud, were pretty content. Sadly, I am no longer the unqualified admirer uh, that I once was. The system still produces a degree of governmental uh, stability, no question about that. It was quite remarkable that the coalition government, uh, Conservative and Lib Dem, lasted pretty solidly for five years in the way uh, that it did. But as for accountability, it's become fairly bogus. What do I mean by that? Not that anybody's cheating. What I mean by that is simply that power and influence in the UK system of government, as in other systems of government, has become even more dispersed, even more fragmented than it used to be. 
to the point where throwing the rascals out may be inappropriate simply because the rascals you threw out were not the people who actually had screwed up. I mean, for, for example, um, I sometimes give a whole lecture on this subject. Uh, who, who governs uh, the UK these days? I've written a book called uh, Who Governs Britain? And the short answer is no one. Uh, a slightly longer answer, and I've written down a list, would include uh, UK ministers, of course, but also the devolved uh, administrations in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. People talk glibly of the National Health Service. There is no such thing in this country as the, the National Health Service. There are four National Health Services run by different governments and run in different ways. Uh, the EU, of course, about which we're going to hear more and more. Other foreign countries, notably the US. Uh, multinational corporations. Uh, ask the people of Redcar uh, about the recent uh, disaster that's befallen them, about which the British government can in practice do very little, or probably ought not to do uh, very much. Uh, the extent to which the uh, UK economy is embedded in an increasingly globalized uh, world market economy. Market <coughs> forces are out there, uh, financial market forces are out there, which uh, no government, not even one led by Jeremy Corbyn, could possibly do uh, very much about. Um, the judges have become much more important than they used to be for reasons we could talk about having to do with the Human Rights Act, having to do with judicial review, and so on. And even, and I think Michael would agree with this, even uh, backbench members of parliament are more important than they used to be. People still moan about the fact that uh, people obey the whip, that they just do what they're told. Will you ask the whips whether it's as easy as that? It's become more and more difficult as time has gone on. The number of rebellions that take place has increased. And I mention all of those, and I haven't mentioned uh, any member of the Murdoch family. Uh, I haven't mentioned uh, Paul Dacre, the editor of the Daily Mail. In other words, the stew, the mix of people and institutions and systems that bear on the way in which the lives of UK citizens are governed is a much thicker, more complicated, richer mix uh, than it used to be. With the result that uh, the uh, reach of British governments far exceeds the grasp of British governments, and I say parenthetically, the claims made by the leaders of British political parties about what they can accomplish if elected to power are almost universally exaggerated. People talk about Britain uh, punching above its weight because <coughs> Britain can't really punch above its weight. Our politicians talk above their weight uh, instead, rhetoric substituting for the capacity for, uh, for action. On top of all that, and I'm explaining why I've become less satisfied than I was with the way in which our system works, uh, has to do with the fact that our system has proved much less competent, uh, much more blunder prone than it used to be. And Michael's already mentioned uh, some of the blunders. Let me mention some more recent ones. I think he would agree that the Lansley provoked uh, reforms of the NHS in England were probably a blunder. Uh, they haven't achieved very much, probably won't achieve very much, and have been very costly in all sorts of terms. We're building aircraft carriers with no aircraft. Uh, the IT disaster catalog is lengthened uh, by the month, a uh, huge expense. You remember the badger call when the badgers moved the goalposts? Uh, surprise, surprise. Um, uh, English votes for English laws. Uh, people have been arguing about this since uh, at the latest 1886, uh, and the present government is making the same hash of it that previous governments uh, have done. And as for immigration, uh, you remember that the uh, Conservative Party promised to bring uh, immigration down to tens of thousands rather than hundreds of thousands. Uh, 
Well, at the very least, the claim uh, was a blunder, but I would go further and uh, following the example of The Economist magazine, which is very strong on this, argue that the government and the previous government's entire immigration policy, sorry, that's not the right word, is it? It's not a policy, it's a sort of happening, an outcome. Uh, has been uh, a complete shambles. I'm frequently asked uh, whether I'm going to produce uh, a third edition of the blunders of our governments, and I say no, not because I think that blundering doesn't go on, but because I do not want to be the country's first ever, the world's first ever professor of blunderology. <laughs> I want to move on to, uh, to other uh, and more interesting uh, uh, topics. The, uh, the next point I render, I'm sorry, I'm having a little physical difficulty because I'm confronted with a, a sign that says tea, coffee, and exhibition. <laughs> um, it's a little bit difficult. Thank you for that. Because you're putting your watch down here, so let me retreat. You will get coffee. I <laughs> no, no. In other words, the promise will be fulfilled. Oh, now I'm told what I'm talking about. Well, that's useful. That's, uh, that, that's helpful. The other reason worth mentioning why I've become rather uh, disillusioned uh, with the existing system is that uh, to a far greater degree than I had previously realized before writing that book is that the very fact that historically and still as regards England, the UK government is one that is centralized and power is uh, concentrated in ministers in the government uh, of the day. That has had uh, one effect, and uh, it would be fun if we had time to talk about this, of making British governments, when they stop and think about it, pretty risk averse. After all, if you are in power, and if you know you alienate enough people, and you have the wit to know what those people think. And if you think that they're going to vote you out of office if you do things that they don't like, you are apt not to do those things. And I'm struck not by the uh, decisiveness of British government, but by how often it takes British governments huge amounts of time, years or decades, to get around seriously to addressing major problems, such as climate change, such as the cumulative consequences of an aging population, such as the issue of how on earth the national health services, plural, are going to be funded uh, in the future. The one that intrigues me most at the moment, because it's so widely publicized, is an increase in airport capacity in the southeast of England. Uh, some of you, uh, they, no, I doubt whether many of you, uh, will realize that that uh, item came on the uh, political agenda first in a big way in 1960, more than half a century ago, when the Roskill Commission was set up uh, to recommend where a new airport should be built. Well, more than half a century later, uh, we still haven't got a decision, let alone an airport. Uh, I, I'm looking forward with uh, horrible fascination uh, to see uh, whether the government succeeds by Christmas, as the Prime Minister has promised us, to nominate a place, and then I will watch with horrid fascination to see whether uh, the airport capacity is actually built on the basis of the recommendation of the Howard Commission or the government uh, or uh, whoever. So I'm arguing that really all is not well. Um, I'm not a sort of admirer of uh, Mary Poppins. I'm not imagining that there is some uh, uh, magic bullet out there that would enable one to get all decisions right all the time. I'm not a believer in a simple uh, institutional mix, uh, 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 magic bullets of any kind at all. Uh, but I do believe that we simply could do better. How might we do better? Well, I think there are two headings under which one can uh, one talk. One of which, by the way, is not trying to introduce a wholly new constitution. The constitutional reform uh, movement, as you know, has rather gone off the boil 
in uh, recent times, but people keep talking about major constitutional change, about our having a written codified constitution. I think, forget it. It would take years to draw up such a constitution. There would be no agreement on it. It would probably be rejected in a referendum, uh, and it would be a complete waste of time, and is in any case uh, unnecessary. What I think could usefully be done uh, is to introduce a number of uh, institutional systemic changes and also maybe to uh, bring about a change in our, uh, uh, our way of uh, conducting politics in what I'll call, um, as we academics do, our political culture or if you like our, our style, our way of, uh, of doing government. Let me just give you two uh, institutional thoughts. One of the uh, topics that is almost never addressed, and I say this in the presence of somebody who was an impressive minister, uh, I believe that, is the quality of our ministers. It seems to me it's reasonable to ask a simple question, are the people who hold ministerial office capable of doing well whatever job it is that they are currently doing? And I think the answer is too often uh, no. Uh, why do I think that? Because people who work at number 10 constantly say, make very rude remarks about uh, the Prime Minister's ministerial colleagues, not just at the top echelon, but further on down. Uh, partly because senior ministers often speak ill uh, of their own junior ministers. Partly because civil servants, in many cases, think they are uh, bossed around by total incompetence. Uh, and partly, uh, simply, I spend quite a lot of time talking to people, uh, social workers, for example, uh, <coughs> top business people, for example, who have dealings with ministers and they frequently tell horror stories about how little impressed they are uh, by these people. Uh, they are not uh, consistently an impressive lot. To be sure, many are. I was talking to a senior civil servant a few months ago and I said, what about the ministers you've worked for? And he said, 50% uh, of them are very good. And I thought, well, what about the other 50%? Uh, it would be nice to think if we have a system in which ministers have so much power uh, that they were pretty consistently uh, competent, that they were 90% uh, up to standard. Well, uh, notice the way in which we choose our ministers in this country. First thing that happens is that somebody gets nominated for a winnable or safe seat. Do the people who nominate our parliamentary candidates devote a lot of time to considering whether the individual in question or the individuals in question would make a good job of ministerial office? The answer is that is very seldom, not never, but very seldom one of the criteria. A very large proportion of the people selected as candidates as we all know, have had no pre-political, non-political experience of the world outside government. Look at most of the people who have been cabinet ministers over the last uh, generation, and a very large proportion of them have had very little experience of the real world uh, outside the uh, Westminster bubble. Our ministers are reshuffled frequently. Uh, that simply doesn't happen. The rate of turnover in the UK is unusually, not uniquely, but unusually high, uh, so that people find themselves uh, doing transport one week and defense the next. Uh, is that uh, sensible? And not least, the size of the gene pool, to use a phrase that the cabinet secretary developed, the size of the gene pool from which we choose our ministers is remarkably small. The House of Commons currently has 650 members. The present government in its wisdom wants to uh, bring that down to 600. Well, that sounds splendid, except that it reduces further the size of the gene pool. 
because the great majority of ministers are drawn from the ranks of the uh, party or parties that support the government in the House of Commons. So you start out with 650 and you wind up with, say, 340. Well, if you then subtract <coughs> the drunks, uh, if you then subtract the, uh, the uh, extremely elderly, uh, if you then uh, uh, subtract those who are clearly dotty, uh, if you subtract those are people who hold uh, totally wild-eyed opinions, which incidentally is why successive Labour Prime Ministers ignored the present leader of the Labour Party, but let that pass. If you uh, subtract those who have been ministers and done a bad job of it, you're left with not many people to choose from. And it's worth reporting, this is a, a factoid, that it is a fact, and I think an interesting one, that Britain and its former colony, Ireland, are the only countries in the EU that require ministers to be parliamentarians. In every other EU country, and in many other countries, including the United States, for example, if you are a minister, you cannot be a parliamentarian, or if you're a minister, you may or may not be a parliamentarian. So that, for example, the, the new Italian prime minister, who seems to be doing a pretty good job, uh, was plucked from the mayoralty of Florence, uh, not from the ranks of the, uh, the uh, Italian uh, parliament. And I think there would be a lot to be said, there are various ways in which one could do that, of making larger and more various in its composition the gene pool from which ministers are drawn in our system. I mean, putting it bluntly, too many of them are not up to the job, uh, and it shows. Second uh, institutional suggestion uh, relates to the House of Commons. Uh, I was a member of the Royal Commission on the reform of the House of Lords. It was great fun, I can tell you, uh, and utterly useless. What's more interesting is that those of us who had, were having the fun also thought we were wasting our time. The serious uh, changes that it seems to me need to take place have to do with the House of Commons, not with the House of Lords, which seems to me to be a peripheral body. The simple fact is that far too much legislation reaches the statute book, uh, ill thought through, uh, a mess. Uh, not enough time has been spent on it, not enough time has been devoted to it in good time uh, before it gets too far down uh, the track. And I think that we need to look very hard at the whole modus operandi of the House of Commons where, in my view, too much attention is still paid to the plenary, to the debates, often very ill-attended, as we know, and not nearly enough to serious committee work. And I myself think it's very odd, and it is indeed very odd, as compared with other countries, that we have specialist select committees on health, transport, and so on, which don't look at legislation relating to health and transport, we have public bill committees that are nominated to deal with bills that do deal with health and transport, but are comprised largely of people who not, know nothing about either health or transport. In most systems, uh, there is one committee a set of arrangements, not two. And if you have a bill relating to health, uh, it is looked at by a specialist committee whose members, uh, in most cases, will have learned quite a lot about the subject and who take advice from officials uh, as well as from, uh, from outsiders. Uh, I could uh, dwell at greater length on changes that I think would be useful in the House of Commons, but you get the idea that I think that uh, changes, institutional changes are useful. But even more important, I think a very strong case can be uh, made out for adopting what I'll call, because I can't think of any better term, a Nordic style of government. If you look at the countries of uh, Europe, our neighbors, probably the best governed are that uh, arc of countries, uh, Finland, Sweden, Norway, Denmark, and I would extend that further down to uh, the Netherlands and uh, to a degree uh, Germany and, and even Belgium 
the fact that Belgium is a well-governed country by two lots of people who hate each other, I regard as one of the most fascinating phenomena uh, in, modern, uh, in modern politics. What does a Nordic style of government consist of? Why, in my view, are these countries pretty well governed? It's because, of course, there is fierce private <coughs> competition, there is the clash of ambitions, there are differing opinions about all kinds of things on very uh, important subjects. But there's also a belief that if you have a, a topic that really requires serious consideration, that you consider that topic uh, in a dispassionate kind of way, uh, that you uh, put aside uh, partisan differences as far as you can, and that the aim of the game is to achieve a consensus outcome rather than to promote dissensus, which is obviously the British uh, characteristic uh, uh, style. Um, we can do it. It was done during the Second World War rather successfully. It's striking that uh, the handling by successive British governments of the problems of Northern Ireland uh, was carried on on this kind of uh, basis. But I think uh, that uh, we could do better by reducing the level of, I would argue, pointless adversarialism uh, in our system. Built into the Nordic style of government is the idea, a word seldom used in English political discourse, of uh, deliberation. What do I mean by deliberation? I mean, as the dictionary suggests, by the way, a weighing up of alternatives in the first place, in the second place, uh, taking your time, uh, brackets, uh, notice the, the desire of British ministers to act at speed. Churchill used to say action this day, and the people around him spent a great deal of time avoiding taking action that day, because it probably wouldn't be a very good idea. Uh, in the Netherlands, there's a saying I've always liked, which is, if you have a hot potato, for pity's sake, put it in the refrigerator. Um, which is what uh, they do. And not least, and here I come to uh, consultation with a small C rather than a capital C, taking counsel, uh, taking on board, not merely, and, and here I agree emphatically with Michael, not merely the views of the vested interests, the lobby groups, but of all those people who either exist as groups already or can be mobilized, who have something to contribute to the discussion, something important to say uh, that ministers ought to listen to. Uh, if more of that had gone on in the case of the poll tax, uh, the poll tax never would have been passed. And for all we know, Margaret Thatcher would still be prime minister. Uh, whether you think that's a good idea or not is another, uh, another question. Uh, the, the notion of consultation, I think, needs to be expanded, uh, and uh, oh, this has already been hinted at uh, in a very large way, so that it doesn't become simply the fairly technical exercise it now typically is, but engages as they do engage in the Nordic countries, in, uh, involving many more people, including, for example, the beneficiaries of the perspective beneficiaries of uh, benefits. Uh, after all, if, you know, if you're buying a car, uh, you ought to weigh up the alternatives available to you. You ought to think about your criteria. Uh, you ought to take your time, unless your car has completely collapsed and you can't afford to rent one. And of course, you ought to talk to people who own a variety of cars to find out whether they're satisfied with their car. We don't uh, tend to do that. Take HS2, for example. I must be the only person in this room who has no strong views about HS2. Uh, but was that done? As far as I can tell, Andrew Adonis had a, a rush of blood to the head, uh, thought that a particular railway line ought to be written, the, uh, built. The, uh, the Labour government took it up quickly. Uh, the Conservatives, not to be outdone, took it up. 
and blow me, we're going to get HS2. But was it, it ever tested against other alternative ways of spending the same amount of money, even spending the same amount of money on, uh, on tra a transport facility of some kind or another? Not as far as uh, I can make out. I think uh, there are a number of advantages uh, that could accrue from our operating in that much more, and here I agree emphatically uh, with Michael, much more pragmatic uh, approach to such a wide variety of questions rather than an ideological approach. The advantages, it seems to me, uh, are that you would be more likely to achieve something approaching optimal outcomes. More attention would be paid to doability. One of the things that is very striking about the blunders described in that book is the minimal extent to which people have asked themselves the question, this sounds a splendid policy, but can it be done? Uh, and, and notice that the introduction of the council tax was done in a much more sensible way uh, than the introduction of the poll tax, partly because that question is, as Michael said, absolutely central to the discussions. Another advantage is you notice, notice that we have stable governments but we don't have stable government policy. We change our policies, whether on nationalization, privatization, taxation, you name it, benefits, uh, more often than the vast majority of other uh, democratic countries. I think there's a good chance if things had been thought through more carefully, if a consensus had been arrived at, uh, policy decisions would actually stick. Notice one, uh, we're one of the few countries that has a budget that changes the tax arrangements, often the tax system every year. We now have two budgets every year. I know of no other country that has two budgets per, uh, per annum. Later on today, you're going to be looking at the way in which some of the so-called wicked issues are handled. I think that a more Nordic style of government would make it easier for uh, ministers and others to, as it were, club together and uh, force the issue of what issues about what to do with an aging population, how to finance the NHS, where to build uh, uh, runway uh, capacity in the southeast. Um, Michael referred to an episode that, uh, that uh, I've written about and recall from the time, uh, which is the desire of uh, John Major uh, to get the pro-Europeans on board uh, the decision to withdraw from the exchange rate mechanism. And uh, why did he do that? Because as uh, Ken Clark characteristically put it, uh, he wanted everybody's fingers dipped in the blood. Uh, well, if you have uh, arrangements in which uh, uh, people in uh, politics are forced to work together or force themselves to work together, there's a better chance that they will club together and tackle wish, uh, wicked issues rather than refrain from tackling them for fear of, uh, of incurring the wrath of the electorate. And just possibly, uh, notice the underlining, just possibly uh, adopting a rather more Nordic style might have some uh, effect on people's uh, respect for politics and the political process and uh, the personalities of politicians. We're living through an anti-politician age. Um, it is less pronounced in the kinds of countries I've been talking about than it is in the UK or, say, in the US. Uh, strikingly so. People are more satisfied with the way in which their government is conducted uh, in those countries. To repeat, uh, I don't believe in quick fixes. I don't believe in gimmicks. Uh, I don't believe that there is any set of institutional arrangements that's going to lead to the sensible solution of all problems. Uh, moreover, I don't really believe that the kind of uh, mindset that I've been talking about is likely to be introduced in this country. Uh, I can only say uh, I wish it were, uh, because to repeat the phrase I used before, I think we could do better. I think we should. Thank you. Not to take control of the 
uh, flicker switch and have it down there when uh, Anthony was inadvertently uh, moving it on. So apologies uh, for that. But many, many thanks for a very rich and full uh, survey of the challenges that governments face. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of us were bringing that down to the sorts of challenges that we face in our day-to-day -day roles uh, in, at, more often at the local level. <coughs> Michael, if I can kick off, Anthony, I think, was proposing the concept of more deliberation. Might that be an appropriate bridge between what you uniquely described as the drivers of ideology uh, uh, getting in the way of good decision making? <clears throat> I'm going to stand up to reply because I, you know, one is live here standing up. Um, well, I, I, obviously that is a, a, a beautiful uh, ideal. Uh, I think one of the reasons that things are getting worse, if they are, and I think I probably agree with uh, Anthony King that they have got worse, um, is um, because of the changes in media uh, and therefore the feeling that politicians have that they need to respond very, very quickly to events. Uh, I, I think one of the most unsatisfactory things about David Cameron's premiership, at least when he was leading a coalition, was this um, tendency to knee-jerk reactions, to um, half-baked announcements, to setting you know, hairs running, uh, really almost on a daily basis, which I think gave him which gave the impression that the government didn't know what it was doing. And uh, at a time when actually the government had rather clear-cut policies, particularly on the economy, it was staggering to me that people would still say to me, I don't know what David Cameron stands for. And so we'll look at what the government is doing. If you look at, look at its economic policy, it's perfectly clear. But the reason they didn't know what David Cameron stood for was that against the... Um, with the clarity of the economic policy, there was all this background noise of announcements on a whole range of policy issues, which actually made it difficult for people to distinguish the main outlines of um, government policy. I, th I think this tendency is somewhat reduced, as far as I observe, since he's become the prime minister of a majority conservative government. But anyway, my point is that politicians clearly do feel that uh, an issue arises, let's say, in the Daily Mail, since Anthony King mentioned that, and that they have to re have a response to it by noon. Uh, and that response might be just a glib phrase, but in extreme cases, it is actually the announcement of uh, a policy. So you need, uh, you need a great deal of self-discipline to say, here is a hot potato, I'm going to put it in the re refrigerator. That is not normally regarded as an acceptable response. So I'm afraid I'm slightly pessimistic um, about you know, what progress we're going to make. I think George Osborne is an interesting case. I mean, because he's not the Prime Minister, he's not forced to do this on a daily basis. Indeed, um, most chances of the Exchequer uh, are not too gabby. They don't feel the need to have an opinion every day about everything. And so you're know, perhaps at one level withdrawn you get more sensible and consistent deliberation uh, from the people who are not, who, who don't feel themselves obliged to have an opinion on every matter every day. But the Treasury is probably the least consultative government department of them all, Indeed. As, you, as you mentioned earlier, which causes difficulties for some of the big decisions that then have a, have a flow down to local communities uh, where this audience will be engaged. Mm -hmm. My, my, my head does comment on that. I mean, that is, for, for good or ill, you're obviously going to say for ill, but for good or ill, this is how the system is designed. The Chancellor of the Exchequer says, uh, you know, the Department of Social Security will spend 10% next year, or whatever the decision is. And the Chancellor and the Chief Secretary will never come across a person, uh, unless it's in their constituency, who is at the receiving end of that decision. Uh, all of that is subcontracted to the ministers, let's say, in the Social Security Department, uh, who have to go off and meet the vested interests, the lobby groups, the claimants, whatever it is, and they get all that appropriate, and they suffer. But the vital thing is, <laughs> the vital thing is, 
that Treasury ministers are not exposed to that. And so they can make these you know, broad decisions in this very unemotional way. Uh, and that is absolutely a feature of the British government. Great, thank you. Now this is your chance to quiz our two experts. Remert uh, has the roving mic. I see a speaker there. I see one here, I see one here. Let's take three quickies here. Remert, middle of the room here. Table nine at the back. And then I'll move over to that delegate and then this one here. So name and number, please. Just talk into it and the techies will turn it on. Yep. Keep, Chris, talking. keep talking. Yep. OK, thank yep. you. Um, my question is about the, the fact we are talking about the blunders of a potential blunders of a new government, which is a majority government compared to the coalition government. And most of the blunders um, we've discussed have taken place where there have been governments with a majority. Um, is there a case to argue that a government which cannot rely on a majority um, is more likely to get a diversity of views and maybe have some higher level of protection against making blunders? Okay, the question about coalitions. Uh, right, Remert, over here, please. Gentleman at table 12. And out of interest, tell us who you are. Um, Chris Witherington of Merton in, in South London. Um, I was actually interested in your take on the events at the Ministry of Justice, where in the space of six months we've had a Secretary of State completely undo all of the work of his predecessor and, and kind of reverse a lot of the big decisions. Is that because of a change in ideology from one minister to the next, or is it simply a, a competent minister clearing up after an incompetent one? Interesting question of competence, thank you. And Remert <laughs> here for a TFL representative. Thank you. Uh, Luke Howard, Transport for London. Um, fascinating couple of talks. Um, a, a theme of mistakes made by not listening enough. But I wonder, Anthony, if you have a, a parallel book to write about the mistakes that have been avoided or the good decisions have been made by not listening. And I think of things <laughs> like the progress in Northern Ireland, where it did depend on doing things that would have been absolutely unacceptable, or mistakes made by listening too much. And I, I recall that in the, uh, a few years ago, there was a meeting of European finance ministers and heads of state, and somebody said they all knew how to fix the emerging problems with the euro. What they didn't know was how to win the elections that would follow. Um, and, and the other thing where, where, where that is massively a problem is, is climate change, where, where it's clear to uh, achieve what everyone, or rather what the informed uh, opinion thinks needs to be done, it's clear that governments are going to have to go against what the majority of their people want to see, which is uh, economic growth and, and, and a disregard of the long-term effects. Great. Thank you. Professor King, would you like to take that? That last question was what I think of as a 50-minute question, <laughs> or at least one requiring a 50-minute answer. Um, uh, the, the first part of it had to do with uh, good decisions that have been taken either because ministers didn't listen or because they knew uh, what people thought and that they wouldn't like it. And the, the answer is that I think uh, one of the, I won't say weaknesses of the book, but one of the limitations of the book is that there isn't enough of that. Um, very, very simply, uh, one of the reasons why I advocate uh, what Michael described as a beautiful ideal, uh, though I'm not an idealist, uh, and I'm, uh, you know, I'm not somebody who believes that you can fix these things uh, easily at all. Um, but one uh, reason why I think a different way of approaching these issues would be helpful is, let, let me use a deliberately controversial phrase, I think sometimes there should be a conspiracy of the elites. Uh, that sometimes, if it is the view is very widely held amongst uh, uh, politicians, amongst senior officials, that something really needs to be done about something, there is something to be said for uh, their uh, accepting responsibility collectively for doing something that's unpopular. If I can give you a, a, an example, not from this country, but from the United States. 
Once upon a time, it was impossible in the United States to close a military base, even if the base was uh, no longer needed for any strategic or tactical purpose. If you had a big air base in the middle of Nevada or somewhere, uh, the system would ensure that that would stay there forever because of the power of the senators from uh, Nevada. And uh, what they did in the US, I think it was very clever, uh, was that they put the business of base closure into commission. Uh, they established a body that would decide which bases should be closed and then left it to Congress either to accept that recommendation, that, that package of recommendations as a whole, or to reject it as a whole. And that has worked magnificently as a way of closing uh, redundant military bases. And uh, I think that, that approach could be used more often. Does that sound uh, undemocratic? It is a bit, yeah. Sometimes I think there is a contest between democracy in the sense of doing what the people want and good government. I think we tend to imagine that somehow uh, democratic decision making on specific issues uh, will inevitably, being democratic, yield optimal outcomes. I think there's a real conundrum there. Uh, and our institutions uh, make it difficult, I think, for there to be that kind of uh, elite uh, collaboration. Uh, as for uh, coalitions, it is worth bearing in mind, and uh, something that neither Michael nor I mentioned, is that even if our governments are not formal co coalitions, they're certainly informal coalitions. If you have uh, governments, majority governments, uh, comprising members of one political party, the chances are, on the, both the Labour side and the Conservative side, you will get people who differ and differ quite uh, strongly. And I think that's, uh, that's in itself uh, valuable. I, myself, uh, inclined to the view that probably coalition governments are, by and large, more often than not, to be preferred. I'm struck by the fact that all of the well-governed countries, and I think they are well-governed countries that I refer to, all of them are governed all the time by coalitions. Uh, I'm also struck by a fact a little noticed outside uh, Germany, is that even when a political party in Germany has won an overall majority in the Bundestag, that has not happened very often, but when it has, the party forming the majority has also formed a coalition. There has never been a yes. one-party government yes. in, uh, in Germany. And I, th I think that tells you something. My sense of a coalition uh, extends beyond coalescing political parties, but trying to create coalitions behind tackling problems. And some of the members of those coalitions may not themselves be uh, politicians. One may never have heard of them. Interesting. Thank you. Michael, some comments on those? Yeah. Um, I, I'm not particularly struck by the coalition government being better. I mean, I was just listening from the last coalition. I think its foreign policy will go down in history as a most disastrous period. Um, Professor King referred to the health reforms, which were, um, don't seem to produce any particular good. I think the energy policy, and this really was a coalition policy, it was Liberal Democrat led, uh, was absolutely disastrous. I think it's put us in a very dangerous position as far as security of 